Let's do another example of Gauss's law, this time with cylindrical symmetry. So now we have an infinitely long cylinder, radius r, as a non-constant volume charge, rho is equal to k times s. So what is the electric field everywhere in this case? Um, so the first thing we have to do with any Gauss's law problem is figure out in what direction does the electric field point. By symmetry, the electric field should only point radially outward from the center of the cylinder. What other direction could it point? So um, since it only should point radially outward, we should probably use cylindrical coordinates. It's a good choice. So the electric field is E, the magnitude in the s hat direction. And by similar reasoning, the electric field should only depend on the distance from the axis. And so the magnitude should only depend on s. So the electric field should just be some function of s in the s hat direction. OK, good. Now we need to choose a Gaussian surface. And uh, a natural Gaussian surface is, of course, a cylindrical Gaussian surface because, well, that's the symmetry that we have. So let's first consider inside of the cylinder, and a little bit we'll consider outside. So we draw a Gaussian surface of length L in radius S, and it has dA vectors for the top, the side, and the bottom pointing out like this. Okay. So again, we uh, wanted to match the symmetry. Generally, you choose a surface that has the same symmetry as your problem. OK, finally, now we want to calculate the flux of the electric field through our Gaussian surface. And the flux in this case is composed of three different parts. There's the flux through the top, the side, and the bottom. So then we have electric flux through the top, electric flux through the bottom, and electric flux through the side. OK, so let's calculate these each individually. So the electric flux through the top, well, notice that dA and E are perpendicular to each other, so you just get 0 here for the flux through the top. By similar reasoning, the flux through the bottom is also 0. OK, so then we just need to compute the flux through the side, E dot dA through the side. So note again that the electric field and dA are in the same direction. Or more precisely, I can write dA as the magnitude dA in the s hat direction. And so this product becomes the electric field times dA magnitude. As usual, the electric field comes out of the integral. So we just have an integral of the area of the side. So the area of the side of the cylinder is 2 pi s, the radius, times its length l. So the total flux through our Gaussian surface is just the flux through the side, e times 2 pi s times l, the length. Now we need to compute q enclosed, the charge enclosed in our Gaussian surface. So that charge enclosed is this little bit here. And unlike other cases, we can't just immediately write this down. We're actually going to have to calculate it by an integral of, over rho d tau. And we need to do an integral because the volume charge density rho depends on s now. And so the charge enclosed is not just rho times the volume. So we're going to have a triple integral. Rho is k s prime. And then our volume factor is s prime, ds prime, d phi prime, dz prime. The s integral goes from 0 to s, phi 0 to 2 pi, and z 0 to l. Now these are three separate integrals. So we have an integral over z, an integral over phi, and then the integral over s. And k comes out in front. So these integrals are straightforward to do. So we have 2 pi l k s cubed over 3 for the charge enclosed. Great, now we're ready to just put this together and put Gauss's law, both sides of Gauss's law together to find the electric field. So we have the flux must be equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught, which tells me that E times 2 pi s l is equal to 2 pi l k s cubed over 3. The 2 pi's, the l's cancel, some factors of s cancel, and we're left over with the electric field is k over 3 epsilon naught s squared. In order to check this result, check the units of it, we need to know what the units of k, this arbitrary constant, is. So remember we had rho is equal to k times s, which tells us that charge per unit length cubed, which is units of rho, must be the units of k times length. So k must have dimensions of charge per length to the fourth in order for this to make sense. 
Okay, great. We can use this to check our electric field to make sure it has the correct units. So our electric field from our result is k, so dimensions of k, over dimensions of epsilon naught, times dimensions of s squared, which is just length squared. Or writing out the dimensions of k, it's charge per length to the fourth, and then there's a length squared up top from the s squared. And so ultimately we're left over with dimensions for our electric field of charge times over dimensions of epsilon naught times dimensions of length squared. And if you forget if these are the right units, uh, recall that the electric field of a point charge is q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, which is units of charge over epsilon naught length squared. So that does indeed match. Um, also, it's worth checking that the electric field at s equal to 0 is 0. And that actually makes sense. Of course, the electric field should cancel again by symmetry at the center. What else could it be? It has to be 0 at the center. OK, that was for inside the cylinder. How about outside the cylinder? So outside the cylinder, we still have the electric field only depending on the radial direction and pointing in the radial direction. So now we need to draw a Gaussian surface that is outside of our cylinder. And so we'll draw one here, it looks like this. And we'll give it some length L. And it has some end caps there. And there's dA vectors which point out at the top, the sides, and the bottom. And this Gaussian surface has a radius, we're going to call it S as before, and a length L. And so the flux through this Gaussian surface, well, it's actually the same as before. I urge you to go through that. Um, it's just electric field times 2 pi times S times L. You'll get the same thing. So now charge enclosed. Again, we have to do an integral over rho d tau prime. But now there's one important difference. So we set up our triple integral as before with d tau prime here. But now our limits on S go from 0 to R because we only care about the charge out to s equal to r. There's no charge at, for s greater than r. In other words, we're just interested in this charge in this region. So we only do our s integral out to s equal to r. Phi from 0 to 2 pi and z from 0 to l as before. So again, this ends up being three separate integrals, neither of which are too hard to do. And we do our integral, we get 2 pi l k r cubed over 3, rather than s cubed over 3, as in the previous case. So now we put Gauss's law together. Again, left-hand side, the flux. Electric flux must be equal to the right-hand side, the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. And so this tells us that the electric field times 2 pi L times s is equal to this charge enclosed here. Notice that factors of r do not cancel, as they did in the previous case. And so we're just left over with the electric field of k r cubed over 3 epsilon naught and a 1 over s factor. That 1 over s should ring some bells. That looks like a line charge. And so this electric field is falling off like a line charge outside. Actually, that makes a lot of sense. Um, outside, it, it should just look like a line. So that's indeed what we find. The dimensions of our result, let's check the dimensions, make sure they're correct. And so we have from k charge per length to the fourth, as usual, as before. We have a length cubed from the r cubed up top and a length from the 1 over s. And after all of the electronic ink dust settles, we have charge epsilon naught times length squared, which are indeed the right units for the electric field. Let's quickly draw a plot of the electric field as a function of s. So as we found the electric field inside is k over 3 epsilon naught s squared s hat. And outside is, as we had there, k r cubed over 3 epsilon naught 1 over s. Okay, so inside we have something that looks quadratic, and then outside it falls off like 1 over r. Okay, so this was another example of using Gauss's law for cylindrical symmetry. And uh, you can check out the other videos for planar symmetry and for spherical symmetry.